Hoosiers are back in action tonight as they travel to Iowa to take on the Hawkeyes. And we have you guys covered with a special crossover episode with Locked On Hawkeyes today, talking all about both of the men's basketball seasons for both programs, strengths, weaknesses of the two teams, and the two standout guys going into tonight's game. You are Locked On Hoosiers, your daily podcast on the Indiana Hoosiers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, guys? It is Thursday, January 13th. This is Locked On Hoosiers, your daily one-stop shop for everything IU athletics, uh, whether it's news, analysis, previews, recaps, everything in between. I'm your host, as always, Jacob Rude. want to thank you guys for making Locked On Hoosiers both part of your day and your first listen every day. Uh, Locked on Hoosiers is free and available on all platforms, just as a reminder, including YouTube at Locked on Hoosiers. Mentioned on uh, Wednesday's episode, trying something new over there. Going to premiere the episode every day at 7 a.m. So you guys can hop on in together, watch the episode live, chat with your fellow Hoosiers. Today's episode, though, is brought to you by NetSuite. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. Head to netsuite.com slash locked for special new year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. As always, you can subscribe to Locked on Hoosiers wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Hoosiers and on Instagram at Locked on Hoosiers. Uh, We recorded the crossover episode a little bit earlier on Wednesday evening. So going to just throw to that now. All right, y'all. It's Andrew Wade of the Lockdown Hawkeyes, Jacob Rude of the Lockdown Hoosiers podcast. And we have Iowa versus Indiana basketball tonight going on. So we thought thought we'd join each other and do a little crossover episode. Before we get started, though, Jacob, my man, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing a lot better uh, now that it's basketball season. We were talking before the podcast. Uh, Never got to thank you in person for absolutely deflating our football (laughs) season uh, almost before it even started. But... uh, Basketball has been a lot kinder to us, and I am I'm way more excited about this uh, basketball season now than I was in the middle of the football season. That's good. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think it's almost the the inverse. I was very excited about this football season. Uh, we had a pretty good run, kind of tailed off towards the end. Uh, basketball has been a little tougher for me this year. Um, the team has been tough to. I love the team. I love the players, but it has been tough to get really excited because every time you get a little excited. Uh, they have issues with rebound. I mean, just some of the stuff they're kind of going through. I'm like, these are things that should not be happening. I, I thought offense would be an issue with this basketball team, but it's more of just rebounding the freaking basketball. Um, so I, I feel like I'm a little bit the inverse of you. Uh, but we're going to be talking about all that on on today's show, man, uh, this Thursday morning. I'm curious, from a huge a huge perspective, uh, a lot of interesting stuff happening in the offseason. You get a new coach. You think Trace Jackson Davis and guys might be leaving. Um, ultimately a couple main guys stay you bring in like three or four transfers um what were the expectations for indiana coming into this season honestly i'm i'm not really sure that there were many uh for all the reasons you said because it, this was just such an unknown um mike woodson comes in obviously a respected nba head coach but uh, it's a whole different animal coaching in college and Uh, He's an older coach as well. There were a lot of reservations about how he would adapt. Um, We obviously knew that Trace Jackson Davis was was really good, but um, all of the other kind of main contributors on this team uh, are are transfers that have come in. So um, there there weren't really expectations. They had a trip to the Bahamas during uh, the summer where it sounded like they played well, um, had some people optimistic, but I don't think in anybody's kind of best case scenario, they would have imagined um, this IU team being 12 and three right now, having a win over Ohio state um, being at uh, 500 in the conference um, or excuse me, over 500 now in the conference. Um, They've exceeded expectations, even if there weren't really any to begin with. Uh, Mike Woodson has been great. Trace Jackson Davis has been, all-American level, and this team has just been a blast. Mainly, I mean, 
probably because uh, they don't really have expectations. So this all just feels like fun. There's no pressure. Uh, they're exceeding all the expectations, and uh, it's been a it's been a blast to to watch this team this year. That's awesome. Here, yeah, I think from an Iowa perspective, coming off of last year's season, people weren't sure of what to expect yet. There's still kind of like an expectation that we should be decent at least, right? And I think we have some components of that uh, decency, but it's a matter of putting together and getting those wins when we need to. Um, I'm curious about, you know, Iowa's losses have been to Iowa State, Purdue, Illinois, Wisconsin, all top-ranked teams, right? Indiana, the losses are a bit interesting when you when you look at them. Uh, losing to Penn State, uh, losing to Syracuse. Um, you did lose to Wisconsin, but all right, that's a pretty good loss at this point. Um, what went wrong in those losses? Well, the first thing is that the trend there is every one of them is on the road. Uh, IU is yet to I win a that. road game. Yeah, I, I was going to say, <laughs> good good, uh, good news for Hawkeye fans. IU is yet to win on the road this year. Um, that's the first trend. I, although um, – that isn't really the only reason the Syracuse game was turnovers, just an absolute ton of turnovers um, against that two, three zone. Uh, they finished with 26 in that game. Uh, the Jeez. Wisconsin. Yeah, it was a double overtime game. It was an absolutely silly game. At one point, um, Trace Jackson Davis went down with like a non-contact knee injury that looked really, Ooh. really bad. And everybody was just like, this is awful. The season's done. He came back in like two minutes later and uh, saved us and sent it to overtime. Uh, obviously, he's been fine. But uh, the Wisconsin game was maybe the the first half was the best half of the season. Uh, we were throttling Wisconsin up by, twenty I think, 23 points in the first half and lost that game. Uh, so we don't wow. even really, – you can imagine what the second half was like. Um, that Penn State game again was – an odd game. IU was coming off. They had a game canceled right around the New Year's. Penn State had three weeks off. Um, the It was just kind of an odd feeling game. Um, but Penn State came out, shot the ball really well. It was IU's worst game of the season, I would say, over a full 40 minutes. Um, offense in general has been an issue for this team. The defense is really, really, really good. Um, and Mike Woodson preached that the minute he got here. The offense outside of Trace Jackson Davis has not been great, which is interesting just comparing these two teams because it feels like just looking at the stats, almost the exact, exact opposite, opposite for, exact for opposite. Iowa this year. It's a new year, guys, and that means New Year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fit or eating healthier, make sure you include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar makes it easier to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good. You're going to want to eat these. Uh, they don't taste like your normal protein bars that are chalky, waxy, or, I mean, honestly, tastes like a chemical spill. Uh, you want to eat healthy, but it just gets so boring that by week three, you're thinking this is just not worth it. Where's the chocolate? Built Bar, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. They're still healthy for you, though. 130 calories, four to five or four grams of sugar, four net carbs, 17 grams of protein in most bars. Compare that to your average candy bar; it's going to be better across the board. Uh, one of the best things, though, is that there are so many flavors to choose from with Built Bar. My personal favorite is cookies and cream. You have salted caramel, mint brownie, peanut butter brownie, raspberry. They're always adding limited time flavors as well. So be sure to head over to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, get 15% off your order today. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Keep telling you guys about this awesome app because it sounds too good to be true, but it is not. Get Upside is an app you guys need to download today. It's really simple. It helps you get cash back on each purchase of gasoline. Uh, it was really easy when I used it, downloaded the app to my phone, found the gas station near me I was going to, entered promo code SCORE, got a special offer uh, up to $0.50 cents per gallon cash back, claimed that offer, drove down to the gas station, checked in, filled up within 24 hours for me. That money was in my account on the app. 
Uh, it's really simple to transfer the money over to your bank account, to your PayPal. You can even get gift cards as well. Uh, as I said, it sounds too good to be true. It is not. Use that promo code SCORE. Get up to 50 cents gallon cash back on your first tank. Gas is something we have to buy anyway. So why not download the Get Upside app? Make some money back uh, while you can. Instead of complaining about gas prices, get the Get Upside app. Use that promo code SCORE. Get 50 cents cat or 50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. Once again, that's promo code SCORE with the Get Upside app. I want to thank you guys for making Locked on Hoosiers your first listen every day. Reminder, we're free and available on all platforms. Now let's get back to our discussion. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, you're completely right. The exact freaking opposite. We're like Iowa offensively. I thought, man, offensively they're going to be worse than last year because you're losing Luca Garza. You're losing a Joe Wieskamp, both NBA players. You're losing a CJ Frederick who could knock down threes at a pretty good clip. Jack Nungy, right? You're losing a bunch of guys who performed well offensively. But I thought defensively, this is where the team is going to shine because they have a lot of length and a lot of guys at that six foot eight range. They have four guys at six foot eight who can kind of guard and defend multiple guys, especially Keegan, Chris Murray, Keegan and Chris Murray and Patrick McCaffrey. Those guys can defend one through four, if not five, depending on how big that five is. I thought defensively this team would be pretty darn good coming into the season but they're actually managing to be worse than any Iowa team in the last like four or five years, which is saying something because Iowa is not a very good defensive team. Um, I do want to quickly, uh, I just quickly looked up the Ken Palm um, expected win for Wisconsin and Indiana uh, at the three minute mark. It gave Wisconsin a 13.8% chance of winning that game at the three minute mark left in the game. I'm um, obviously Wisconsin going on to win that game. So very unfortunate. Um, I'm curious about the turnovers. Because Iowa um, is kind of get these are very polar opposite teams. Iowa does not force or does not turn the ball over hardly ever. They're a fantastic team at keeping possession of the ball. They always have been, but they're also really good at forcing teams to turn the ball over as well. They've gotten better at stealing the basketball. Um, have you seen turnovers be an issue throughout the season, or is it really just that Syracuse game really inflating those statistics? Early in the season in general, they were a problem. Even before that Syracuse game, uh, it was a known issue. Uh, through the first, <clears throat> excuse me, through the first 10 games this year, uh, IU averaged 15 turnovers a game. Um, they only had two games that they didn't have double-digit turnovers. And then over the last um, five games, it's been much, much better. Um They've only turned the ball over 21 times in the last three games combined. Uh, so it was very much a problem early in the year. And it is, <clears throat> it, it's been trending in the right direction for a while. So I don't think it is as much of a problem. The two issues that were problems kind of at the beginning of the year for IU were turnovers and three point shooting. Uh, and the turnovers have kind of dissipated, and the three point shooting has gotten better and better. Though there's been a couple games um, in the the last little bit, that Penn State game, they actually didn't shoot the ball well against Ohio State. Uh, they just played so well defensively that they kind of overcame that. But um, in general, those two games um, or those two things were the problems at the beginning of the year for IU that they have gotten turned around of late. That's good, man. Good. Uh, good for Indiana, at least not not for Iowa. Um, I would love to see a little bit, a few more, a few more turnovers. I'm curious. You mentioned with uh, Indiana defensively is really, I mean, according to Ken Palm, they're a top ten team defensively, or I think they're number eleventh in Ken Palm. Um, a very strong defensive team. How has the defense changed under Mike Woodson, or has uh, it changed? Oh yes, um, Archie, <laughs> Mi Archie Miller. Um... That was not enjoyable basketball to watch, and it was hardly successful basketball. I mean, that's why he was fired. Um, that's been a thing that we've talked about all year, just comparing this team to Archie Miller, because a lot of the big contributors are new, but uh, players like Trace Jackson Davis, Race Thompson, Rob Finnessy, all were here last year, and um, just seeing what Mike Woodson has gotten out of them that um, Archie Miller could not is – startling at times but 
when it comes to this defense, one of the biggest things is the transformation Trace Jackson Davis has made on that end. Uh, he's one of the top rim protectors, definitely in the Big Ten. Um, and there's probably not a whole lot of a whole lot of guys better in the country. Uh, he is. It's been wild because it's not even like he went from like an average, maybe below average defender to uh, good. He went from honestly a bad defender to a great defender uh, in his time at IU. And he's made the biggest jump under Mike Woodson. Um, the hit uh, trace Jackson Davis and race Thompson uh, in the front court. Both are really, really good defensively. Um, race is more kind of positional. He's not the overwhelming athlete necessarily, um, but the two of them kind of anchor things down uh, in the paint, and it allows the guards to be super, super aggressive. Um, and just kind of pairing all that together has has led to a formula for success. That being said, just looking at, at Iowa's offense, I don't know that Indiana has played anybody nearly this good uh, offensively. Um, you, as you said, you guys don't turn the ball over. You don't get blocked, anything like that. And those are two of the areas IU kind of excels defensively. What is it about this Iowa offense that, that makes them so great? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So I, I want to, you talked about Trace and, and Race. Uh, they're allowing a 39% two point percentage, which is first in the country. Uh, pretty yeah. phenomenal. I think when you look at Iowa's offense, uh, you have to factor in Jordan Bohannon. When you look at how teams have defended Iowa, they usually take one of their better defenders and they try to lock down Jordan Bohannon because he might not be the guy who's going to win the game for Iowa every time, but he's also the guy who, when Iowa's down 15, he's the guy who can bring Iowa back. And when you look at Wisconsin, what they did defensively against Iowa, they basically put Brad Davison, who is very dirty, but one of the better <laughs> defenders yeah. uh, in, in all of basketball, they had him just sitting on Jordan Bohannon. Just don't let Jordan Bohannon shoot the ball. I think where this team varies from last year, where last year was – running the offense through Luca Garza, Luca Garza being very good around the rim, but also very good at passing uh, to the open three point shooters. This year it's more about dribble and drive and getting to the basket and being willing to kick it out if need be and getting out in transition. Um, I think where Iowa has struggled a little bit is having a number two option in this offense. Um, they haven't had a consistent guy every single time. Now in some regards, that's a, that's a positive, right? If you have a number, a different number two guy every night, but I think the problem is, it's not like we have a number two guy that's different every night and then a number three guy who's consistent. It's just all over the board with who is going to be that guy to step up in regards or next to Keegan Murray. Um, I think where Iowa can be dangerous offensively is the fact that Keegan Murray is so skilled at getting to the basket and creating his own shot and also shooting three. I mean, this guy can literally do it all. There's a reason why he is um, considered one of the national player of the year front runners, and he's a leading scorer in all of college basketball. It's because he can he can score in so many dynamic ways. Jordan Bohannon can shoot the three. Patrick McCaffrey can get to the basket. He just struggles with with capitalizing on the opportunities once he gets there. I don't know what it is. It, it's been something I've kind of noticed over the last couple of years. He can get to the basket, but it's just it's one of those things where it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't feel like it goes in ever. Uh, even when he when he gets up there. So to answer your question, I think it, it really just Keegan Murray. Keegan Murray has been uh, phenomenal. Uh, we've seen some really good performances from a, a collection of guys, but it hasn't been consistent across the board. Three-point shooting is always going to be kind of an interesting thing to watch with Iowa. Again, Jordan Bohannon being kind of the main guy there. But Peyton Sanford, who's a true freshman, can come off the bench, basically do Jordan Bohannon type of things uh, with a little bit better defensive effort. Ke Chris Murray, uh, Keegan's brother, is also a great three-point shooter. Uh, something to watch out for as well. Also a guy who can drive to the basket. And then Tony Perkins has developed a bit of an outside shot too. So Iowa can just attack you from a variety of different ways. And they like to get out in transition. They are going to, and that's honestly probably why they struggle so much with rebounding is that their guys are trying to get out in transition before they even secured the ball. And that gives other teams a lot of great opportunities. So it's been, we have, we have a very good offense, but it's it's been kind of frustrating because some of our success offensively is honestly maybe played over into our lack of success defensively. This is it, the putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software? To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. 
With the visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more, NetSuite is everything you need to grow all in one place. With NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time while staying well ahead of your competition. 93% of surveyed businesses increase their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. Over 28,000 businesses already use NetSuite. And for the new year, NetSuite has a new financing program for those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash locked. Head to netsuite.com slash locked for this special one-of-a-kind financing offer on the number one financial system system for growing businesses. Easier said than done. netsuite.com slash locked. It's going to be interesting to see how the Hoosiers match up then. They did just have success against another um, player of the year kind of candidate and EJ Liddell. Uh, they made his night awful against IU uh, about a week ago. Um, but again, this seems Keegan Murray, just looking at the statistics seems like a different kind of beast. Um, wouldn't be surprised if race Thompson starts on him. Um, that's who drew the primary assignment on uh, EJ Liddell though. I think one thing that IU did really well on that night, and we'll see how much they can replicate it against Iowa, is they were always just aware of where EJ Liddell was on the floor, um, whether it was a drop-off pass or a driving kick or even just rebounding and putbacks. Um, they they knew where EJ Liddell was going to be and got a body to him, make sure everything was contested for him. Um, but yeah, Keegan Murray just, he, he's been impressive this season, been really, really good. This is going to be the, the biggest test yet for this Hoosier defense, um, who really, we haven't played a lot of really good, I mean, we haven't played a lot of really good teams or really good offenses in general. Um, part of hiring a Mike Woodson as a first year coach is we just filled the non-conference schedule with really easy opponents to try to figure things out as we went and uh, the kind of knock on the IU team until that Ohio state game is they didn't really have a big win. Um, and that was a win at home on prime time, all that fun stuff. So this is a, a different kind of test. Um, the Hoosiers, or I mean, I mentioned they haven't been good away from assembly hall either. So um, I, it, it's going to be interesting because these are two of the best, players in the Big Ten in general as well that uh, will be matching up against one another. But um, it's strength versus strength. Um, I guess on the other side of the ball defensively, um, I mean, it's a it's a poor IU offense against a, a poor Iowa defense. So uh, where has Iowa kind of struggled defensively then? Uh, believe me, I've seen this before where we play a poor offense and it makes our poor defense look even worse. We make bad offenses look good, man. It is it's bad. Um, I want to touch on a point you said earlier, and I'll get, get to your question here in a second. Um, I think Keegan and EJ are, are definitely different players too, which will be really yeah. interesting to see how they match up because Keegan to me is more of a guy who he plays more like a tall – I would say more like a three, whereas EJ Liddell plays more of a traditional four or five just being undersized. Uh, yep. Keegan going to be a bit quicker, able to drive the basket a bit easier, a better three point shooter. So his outside game is probably a bit better while his inside game, you're not going to see Keegan uh, backing guys down. He's not going to sit there and back down Trace Jackson Davis and, you know, play back the basket. So that'll be, it'll be interesting to see how they do handle uh, Keegan Murray is that has been the focal point of everybody's attention. It's Keegan Murray and Jordan Bohan and, and let the other guys beat you. And um, to a degree that's worked. Uh, but I think where, when you mentioned the defense and, and what has been the issue, um, Iowa has traditionally liked to play a lot of zone. Um, when you look at Iowa from an athleticism perspective, man defense isn't going to be the best feature of our team um, typically, but we have better athletes than we have in the past, especially at, at the wing position or the, the guard and wing positions outside of, of Jordan, who's not a terrible athlete. He's just not overly quick to be able to handle some of the better point guards and shooting guards in the conference. Um, so we, we traditionally played a lot of zone, but when we play a lot of zone, we struggle with rebounding the basketball. If that's just that's just our biggest issue. We can hold we can hold teams to almost the entire shot clock and they'll miss a open three or two or whatever it might be, and we don't get the rebound. I have 
it is amazing the ways we don't get a rebound. <laughs> um, and it's incredibly frustrating. And, and what happens is we get absolutely annihilated on second, third, and sometimes fourth chance opportunities. And those are demoralizing as heck for a team, but it all comes down to rebounding. I think Iowa, if they could just get to the basket, and that's when you see Iowa switch to man, which then exposes some weaknesses in some of our on ball defense potentially. So, um, it's kind of a mix or match there. Um, we oftentimes, uh, I always find this interesting. Last year, I was always doing some reports on it. Um, pick a random guy who hasn't shot the ball really well for any given team, and we're going to let him look like he's Jordan Bohannon. I think last year it might have been Rob Finnessy, um, who shot lights out against Iowa one of their games. I'm like, this guy has not shot the three well all season. He comes into this game and hits like six of eight threes against Iowa. So um, there's going to be opportunities there unless Iowa can clean up rebounding. In their losses, it has been because of rebounding. That has been the biggest, the biggest issue. They just get just destroyed on the baskets. I think Kofi Coburn almost out rebounded our whole team when we played <laughs> Illinois, and, and we, we were still in that game. So it's it's definitely rebounding. That's where our biggest issues are now. Uh, successfully, we have done a pretty good job in a full court press. We have had a lot of success in the full court press, half court trap, that kind of stuff. Really putting a lot of pressure on ball pressure early on in the shot clock, um, but we can't do that all game. And so, and usually we, we try to do it when we get a little run and then we really, that's where we turn a two point lead into a 15 point lead. Um, or if we're down by 15, it's not usually just our go-to strategy for middle parts of the game that are just trucking along like normal. Uh, good news is Rob Finnessy had his big three point shooting game against Minnesota. Cool. So <laughs> I don't think he's going to be the one that does it. I went and looked. Yeah, hilariously, last year, Rob Finnessy uh, never made more than two three-pointers in a game and made four against you guys. Um, yeah, every time. I don't do it. <laughs> Literally, like, it's every single game against any team, one guy who had no idea, you never heard of his name before, like, I'll, I'll look up, a, I'll look up the Ohio, there's an Ohio State guy who had, like, a max of three points the entire season and had 25 or 26 against Iowa, like, two years ago. Just absurd. Sorry, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I'm just like very passionately annoyed about how Iowa allows open three point shooters. Yeah, I was trying to look see who could, could potentially be that guy for IU. Xavier Johnson uh, is our point guard who um, I have described his jumper as Lonzo Ball without the makes. Um, <laughs> it is going to be as funky of a jumper as you guys have seen this year. Uh, he. So Minnesota, the way they defended IU, uh, and I think this could be something teams do more in the Big Ten, is uh, they earnestly just packed the paint. There were five guys with a foot inside the paint, um, all kind of being very aware of where Trace Jackson Davis was, and they dared IU to beat them from the three-point line, um, specifically Xavier Johnson and Rob Finnessy. Um, the two of them hit six three-pointers in the first half against Minnesota, very uncharacteristic, and Minnesota adjusted uh, their defense, and IU won kind of going away a bit in the second half. Uh, I still think the way Minnesota was doing it was a bit extreme in that they weren't within 10 feet of Rob Finnessy on any of his three-point attempts. Um, I still think that that's kind of the formula that teams might take with this IU offense. Um, if I was looking at a guy that might break out for this, uh, this three pointer barrage that might happen, Parker Stewart at the beginning of the year was, um, hitting over 50% of his threes. He's had a bit of a slump lately. Um, he is due for a big game. Um, Tamar Bates is a freshman five-star recruit who it's been a little up and down with him. Uh, beginning of the year, he played really well. He's been in a bit of a slump as well of late. His minutes have started to go away as we've went into Big Ten play. Ultimately, though, this IU team kind of lives and dies by its guards. Uh, for as good as Trace Jackson Davis is, there's been many nights at Penn State game, for example. He did everything he could to try to, to save IU from a, a really frustrating loss, but the guard play, the three-point shooting – wasn't good enough ultimately and the Hoosiers couldn't get enough stops to um, come out ahead in that one. So this IU offense really, uh, it, it just depends on how 
Um, the non Trace Jackson Davis guys are shooting and are playing. Trace is going to get his. Race Thompson plays incredibly well off him. He's going to be flirting with a double double uh, by the end of the night. But then there have been multiple nights where nobody else on the team has more than six points or eight points. Uh, that Penn State game, that Wisconsin game um, are examples. So um, if you can kind of limit everybody else, which hasn't been too hard to do at times this season. I think that would be the formula for Iowa to find success. Uh, but of late, the Hoosiers have done really well. Um, a lot of teams are, are doubling uh, Trace Jackson Davis and not really being worried about the Hoosiers knocking down threes. And instead of them taking threes, they've been doing a lot more driving and kicking and passing and getting an open shot that way. Uh, you mentioned a zone. I wouldn't be surprised if you guys tried that as well because IU has been very hot and cold against his own defenses this year. That Syracuse game we mentioned, they had 26 mm -hmm. turnovers, and that's all Syracuse runs. Um, those possessions either ended in turnovers or dunks. So that's kind of been what IU has done against uh, zone defenses this year is either just – mind-numbing turnovers or Trace Jackson Davis gets a dunk. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if Iowa went to a fair bit of zone as well against the Hoosiers because it's not been something they've been great at this season. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Like I said, the, this is a tale of two different two different teams uh, with the, exact, the strengths that match up very well against each other to make for a very interesting game. Uh, to me, this looks like either Iowa is going to honestly blow Indiana out or Indiana is going to win by like three or four. Um, I want to I want to make note that you mentioned being on the road has been tough for Indiana. Uh, Carver Hawkeye Arena is probably one of the worst home court advantages in the Big Ten. Uh, the fan support is is not good, right? It's just not the best environment. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't hurt Iowa too much in this game. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting, man. If 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 they struggle that much against his own. Uh, I just I don't trust Iowa's zone to be able to to handle that. But we've seen the the show before where you know last year with Iowa teams allow Luca Garza to get his stop the wings and you win the game, and a lot of teams yeah. did that. Indiana did that uh, seemed to work well. So um, it'll be an interesting game. What are your final predictions, man? Until this IU team wins a road game, uh, I don't know if I can uh, predict it to win one. Um, I would probably say. Iowa by probably seven to eight points. Um, final score would be something like 80 to 73, maybe, maybe a little bit lower than that, but somewhere right around there, I think Iowa will probably win this. Uh, this is a really tough place to potentially get your first road win. And I don't trust the Hoosiers on the road yet. Yeah. I'm struggling with this. Um, because Iowa has had a break, which is good. They're coming off a very bad loss against Wisconsin. They are getting a little bit healthier. Man, I, I'm going to hate – I just hate playing Indiana. Some about – Indiana in basketball is like <laughs> playing Northwestern in football or Purdue in football for the Hawks. Like the last couple of years, it just seems like Indiana has been a thorn in Iowa's side. But I do think Iowa can come out and get the W. And I, I will say probably a 7-10 to 10 point win. Um, I'm going to probably say like – 84 to, to 74 at this point, just um, Indiana is going to get theirs. Even if their offense hasn't been good, they will, they will get some against Iowa. That won't be a problem at all. We found a way to let teams uh, eat a little bit too. Uh, Jacob, it has been a blast talking to you about Iowa, Indiana basketball. Uh, for the Hawkeye fans out there listening, you can find Jacob at Jacob Rude on Twitter, covering the Locked On Hoosiers or the Indiana Hoosiers at the Locked On Hoosiers podcast Monday through Friday. As always, you can find me, Andrew Wade, covering the Hawkeyes Monday through Friday as well at Locked On Hawkeyes. Jacob, any last words, man? Uh, good luck. Hope it's a fun one tonight. Yeah, man. Go Hawks. Go Hoosiers. <laughs> That'll wrap it up for today, guys. We did not get to the uh, women's basketball game that is also taking place on Thursday night. Uh, they are not playing Iowa, so that obviously was not something we discussed uh, on the uh, crossover episode. They are playing Nebraska. Uh, we will certainly talk about uh, the Hoosiers women's team. Nebraska is 13-2 and on the year, 2-2 two and two in the conference, though, so be an interesting game that we will talk about on Friday as we recap both the men's and women's games. I want to thank you guys for all the support. As always, subscribe to the show if you haven't already. Leave a rating and review. Most importantly, though, guys, have a great Thursday and Elio.